So this is uh, day three, video two, and uh, this is the World Religions theme lecture for today. And our topic is practicing comparative religion. And our learning objectives are learning how to distinguish between the historical and comparative approaches in studying religion, um, uh, giving some examples of the comparative approach, and looking at what the outcome, appraising the outcome and uses of the comparative method, the risks and benefits you, uh, analysis, you, you might say, of becoming a comparativist. So, um, in the academic study of religion uh, has long been divided between two basic approaches, the historical approach, which studies uh, a specific religious tradition, uh, usually some very limited aspect of it. And then there's the comparative approach that looks, that ranges over multiple religious traditions, ideally all that are known, to find patterns, to discern the commonalities between the traditions. Now, among many people uh, outside of the university, if I say that I'm a professor of religion, they'll, it's easier for me sometimes to say that I'm a, I'm a comparative religionist, because most people think that what religion professors do, many people think that what religion professors do is comparative religion. They're looking for the similarities. But it's completely different inside our field. Inside our field, comparative studies have, have for at least 30 years now been discredited as illegitimate. That's starting to change. As always in the intellectual life, one generation's, uh, uh, one generation's uh, forbidden zones, uh, which were, the, for, which were the, the pet interests of perhaps the generation of, of teachers uh, a generation earlier, they very quickly, within a generation or two, make a comeback. So comparative studies are making a comeback. And, and why are comparative studies important? And, and I am, in, it truly, in that sense, a comparativist, because by finding these underlying patterns, we can, if you will, create a science of religion. Now, I'm using the word science in an old-fashioned sense. It goes back to the Latin word scientia, which means disciplined knowledge. In that sense, grammar is a science. Logic is a science. It's not empirical science. And so comparative religion is a science in the sense that if we could detect the common patterns that are expressed in multiple religious traditions, we could find the common language of religion. We could find the basic ideas that each religion tries to impart to generation after generation under different suns and in different climates. It's as if there's like a message that's being given to us through the world's religions. And it's one of the forms of divine self-expression, just as the natural world is, alongside the book of nature, there is uh, the book of religion. And so comparative religion is very important in giving us the basic concepts that can allow us to evaluate and read every religious tradition. Now, this is controversial. I know because it, some will say, well, no specific religion says what comparative religion says. Right. And it's also the case that if I'm looking uh, at different kinds of cars or different kinds of coffees, each coffee or car will have different characteristics. And I carry in my mind an evaluative standard that cars should have X, Y, and Z attributes or a coffee should be like this. And if it, if it turns out that the car I'm looking at actually doesn't have too many car attributes, I'm not going to buy it. And so knowing the common ideas that, and themes of religions can help us evaluate whether this religious tradition is actually being faithful to the fundamental uh, truth of religion or not. It doesn't matter if it's controversial, because if you have a short view of controversies like this, you'll see that um, you shouldn't give up your basic intuitions because one generation of scholars opposes them, because all you have to do is wait a generation or two, and your, your students or the students of your students will be reviving you. It's pretty simple. So comparative study and historical study, you cannot have the study of religion without the two of them. We need them in tandem with each other so that the historical can chasten and correct the comparative and the comparative can chasten and correct the historical approach. All right, so let's just take for granted that comparative religion can actually teach us something. Um, and uh, the basic idea of comparative religion is that religions share basic Similar and basic patterns. Religious traditions share basic 
and similar patterns, but they differ in how they express them. And those people who want to study the differences, great, that's wonderful. If you want to study the difference between a Honda and a Mercedes, wonderful. But if you're interested more in what makes a car a car, then comparative studies is, 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 is what I'm offering you today. So what are some basic ideas that are common across traditions? Now, not every idea will be common to every tradition. Some might, may be common to all, but many are common to a lot of traditions, if not all. So for one, one thing, many religions speak about divine beings, gods, angels, uh, devas, devata, and so on. Now, not every religion does. Some religions are decidedly against the notion of referring ultimately to divine beings. Uh, and yet they, and so that doesn't, but that doesn't disprove the fact that many religious traditions are focused upon divine entities. Many religious traditions have scriptures, not all, but many, especially religious traditions of the last thousand or so years. Scriptures seem to be central to these traditions. The list of common ideas which forms a grammar of the spiritual life is long, and I won't read all of these to you. Uh, but I'll just, a couple to be suggestive, the idea of prayer, spirituality, notions of divine incarnation, the idea of revelation. Many religious traditions have a revelation idea. Hinduism has revealed scriptures, as does Islam, Judaism, Christianity. Buddhism doesn't have revealed scriptures, but believe me, the scriptures of Buddhism are central and extremely important to tradi traditional Buddhists. Um, and so on. The notion of grace is, is a part of many traditions, but even traditions without an explicit notion of grace depend upon the idea of a teaching that appears to guide us, which is itself a kind of act of graciousness. All right, so um, that's the basic idea of how comparative religion works. This is my basic methodology. And, but, you know, there are risks and benefits. Now, some of the uh, some of the benefits of comparative religion is that in stressing patterns, this is the intuition that gives rise to science. When you see a pattern, you can formulate a law, a provisional law. And so that means that religion is reality-based. Just like the, the changes in the brain that occur when meditating, so the fact that certain ideas recur continuously in religious experience means that religion is onto something. Just like if I continuously detect that uh, d different smartphones have a feature that I'm interested in and I buy it. Um, it uh, um, and so, so related to that is that comparative religion, very importantly, de-emphasizes religious difference. It can help you overcome fundamentalism and exclusivism and literalism if you realize that your teaching is identical logically to the teaching of the people you're opposed to except in the historical details and matter. I mean, that's an important insight. In fact, that insight that the religions are pretty much the same in their form, if different in their content, can give you your religious freedom back give you your spiritual freedom back. You can say, on the, it's like science. Science set the, the world free from traditional forms of authoritarianism. When we realize that those people in that part of the world, they were doing the same thing in a different language that we're doing here, it means that you don't necessarily have to stay with the religious tradition of which you're a part. That's a radical idea. That's a revolutionary idea. It's a dangerous idea. But it's also a liberating and freeing idea. Um, and so... It can, of course, the downside to that is that it can cause confusion and anxiety and even outrage. It's a dangerous idea. That's probably one of the reasons why it often gets suffocated or smothered in academic settings. But I'm here to say that it's never going to go away as long as religions differ but are similar in many deep and profound ways. So those are some of the benefits, and I started to move towards some of the negatives, and that is that not everybody responds to the recognition of similarities in different religions in the same way. Some people become deeply skeptical. They say, well, they can't agree on anything. They're all different. And there are some basic ideas here that they're trying to express, but uh, maybe we can explain this in some other way. So there's a kind of a skepticism. That, let me state that a little bit differently. If you become, because you recognize that another religious tradition is similar to yours, you may become skeptical about your own tradition and thus no longer trust in it and not trust in religion in general. That's a real outcome of comparative studies. And also, and I see this as a positive, when you know this, you can actually start, you can become a reformer yourself. 
You can begin to revise religious teachings, as Sir John did. And as I suggest, we all have the freedom to do, even if sometimes that freedom is too dangerous to exercise in your own particular context. That may be a West, modern Western idea, but I think it goes to the freedom that we, that we actually have, our formal freedom, our formal religious freedom that we have as human beings.